Good afternoon, everyone. We are waiting for uh, more people to join, but we are going to start uh, this, this afternoon session. So hello, everyone, and welcome to this ESIP online conversation. My name is Fredrik Eriksson, and I'm very pleased to welcome today Hans Kuntnani, a thoughtful and thought provocative scholar and writer who has been in the global think tank community for quite some time and who writes about matters such as geopolitics, security, Europe, uh, German politics, and the health of liberalism. He is now the director of the Europe program at Chatham House and has previously been with the German Marshall Fund and the European Council on Foreign Relations, among others. He is also the author of the book, The Paradox of German Power, and he joins me now from London. Hello, Hans. I'm very glad to have you with me today. Hi, Frederick. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that kind um, introduction. So you had very recently, a, I would say, a very powerful piece in The Guardian that builds on a longer essay that you published in The New Statesman in February this year, where you chart a change in the way that some or many people think about Europe and its identity. The gist of it, and correct me if I'm putting my words in your mouth, is that the political thinking about Europe has become less cosmopolitan and more occupied with concepts that are closer to nationalism or a civilization-based political order that defines itself against the other. So can we start here, Hans? Uh, what has changed in the thinking about Europe in your mind? Thanks. Um, yeah, good question. And, and I think that's a pretty accurate summary of of what I've been arguing in, in those two pieces. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd maybe sort of add two sort of caveats though. I mean, one is that my argument is not quite that Europe has become less cosmopolitan, but that it was never cosmopolitan actually. Um, it's just that some pro-Europeans imagined that it was. Um, and, you know, it seems to me actually that that in itself is, is, is kind of an expression of, of Eurocentrism because there's this tendency, I think, among pro-Europeans to sort of mistake Europe for the world, right? Europe is not the world. And if you have openness and integration and so on within Europe, that doesn't mean you're open and integrated with the rest of the world. Um, these are two quite different things. And I think that is a sort of, a, a sort of typical kind of Eurocentrism that you get amongst um, pro-Europeans. Um, so, you know, it was never, I think, a cosmopolitan project. Um, and the way I think it's most helpful to think of what, you know, the EU stands for and, and what European identity stands for is, is, you know, rather than cosmopolitanism, it's regionalism. You know, it's not nationalism because obviously Europe is not a nation, but it is a region. And so I, I find it helpful to think in terms of regionalism, which is kind of analogous to nationalism. Um, and, and in particular, I think what that means is that, you know, again, there's a tendency in some European countries, particularly Germany, um, to think of nationalism as a purely sort of negative phenomenon. Um, I think it's more complicated than that, not least, you know, I mean, my father's Indian. And, you know, if you think about, say, Indian nationalism, I don't mean Hindu nationalism now. I mean, Indian nationalism, you know, in the context of independence, this was a progressive anti-colonial movement, right? And I think what that illustrates is that nationalism can be progressive, it can be reactionary, it can be inclusive, it can be exclusive. For the purposes of this discussion, you know, importantly, it can be ethnic or cultural, or it can be civic. And my argument is essentially that regionalism is kind of the same. You know, regionalism can be progressive or reactionary, it can be inclusive or exclusive, it can be ethnic or cultural, or it can be civic. And in the history of European identity and the European project, it's had all of these different tendencies as a you know, complex history, which I, I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but that, you know, regionalism isn't some automatically progressive alternative to nationalism. It's sort of quite analogous to nationalism, essentially. That, that's basically my argument. And then in terms of the, the sort of transformation, I mean, you asked what's changed. The way I think of it, um, is that it's, it, there's basically been a transformation in two stages during the last decade um, since the Euro crisis started. And, and I think that was the, you know, the, the first sort of probably critical juncture, um, you know, followed then by a series of other crises. And, and so I think the, the, the first thing that happened, I think, is that Europe became much more defensive 
um, increasingly started to see the world in terms of threats um, and, and, you know, pro-European thinking went from being this quite expansive way of thinking about um, sort of endlessly exporting the European model and remaking the whole world in, in the image of the EU. That was problematic in its own way as well. Um, but I think increasingly pro-Europeans have shifted away from that expansive way of thinking about what the EU was and stood for to a much more defensive model where it's about protecting, you know, this, this word protection, you know, has become really, really powerful within, within sort of EU discourse. And it's all about protecting the EU from various kinds of threats. So I think that's the first kind of shift that happened towards a kind of defensiveness. And then the second shift, and I guess, if you had to point to a critical juncture, you would say it's the refugee crisis in 2015. What's happened in particular since then, I mean, it didn't start then, but particularly since then, and as a consequence of the way that the far right, I think, has become more powerful throughout Europe, particularly since 2015, I think that what's happened is that those threats to Europe have been perceived and, and understood in increasingly civilizational, cultural kind of ways. Um, so, you know, you've, you've you sort of had this, this um, increasing use of you know, concepts like the European way of life and European values and, 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 and even talking about Europe as a civilization. And so I think these, you know, you put these two things together and, I, and it, it, there's a kind of a, a sort of defensive civilizationalism, I think, you know, um, and, and that to me is what increasingly um, is, is, you know, it's sort of shaping um, the way that the pro-Europeans think. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things there, Hans, to come back to, but let's just for the purpose sort of of, um, of making sure that uh, uh, other people also follow sort of your argument. So you talk about pro-Europeans here. So, I, I mean, from that, I can sort of conclude that, well, it's not sort of an, an urban vision of Europe that has taken hold, right? It's, it's, it's not that that you're talking about. You're talking about something which is much more anchored in sort of the political center in Europe. Is that right? That's exactly right. And, 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 um, and, and that's, that's what I'm, a big part of what I'm trying to draw attention to is it seems to me that there has been this tendency, particularly since, since 2016, probably, to think in quite binary ways of this, you know, struggle between liberalism and illiberalism, between centrism and populism, between the EU and Euroscepticism. Um, and actually, to me, this seems a lot sort of murkier, I suppose. Um, and in particular, I sort of already hinted at this, you know, when, when I was saying that the far right, you know, has increasingly been sort of shaping the discourse among pro-Europeans. Um, you know, the, I, I think, you know, Orban and Macron are perhaps a little bit less further away from each other than one might think, or that pro-Europeans want to think. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, there's, there's this tendency among pro-Europeans to focus on, on the, you know, the Eurosceptic populists. And I'm, you know, not a fan of Orban, but I think we also need to, um, you know, examine what pro-European centrists are doing and saying. And, and actually, my impression is that increasingly it's the far right that is shaping a lot of their discourse. Um, I mean, you see it particularly, I think, in, in France, um, in terms of, you know, debates around Islam and, and immigration. Um, and, and often, I, you know, I sometimes, I sometimes have the impression when I listen to some pro-Europeans talk, is that the only thing that distinguishes them from the far-right Auburn types is that they're pro-European rather than Eurosceptic, right? But they're using many of the same tropes. And, and this brings me back to the point I started with, because I think often they can't see it because... They say, well, but we're pro-European. We're not nationalists. That's nationalism you're talking about. Um, and, and because we're not, we're anti-nationalist or post-nationalist and we're pro-European, we're doing this at the regional level. It's not the same thing, but, but actually often it is. And, you know, an example of this would be, you know, if you look at the way that co the concept of sovereignty is, is, is used by pro-Europeans, very critical of the way that that concept is used at the national level, you know, obviously, particularly in the Brexit context, Brits talking about sovereignty even though Brits, you know, we're talking as much about popular sovereignty as national sovereignty, actually, in the Brexit context. And yet, Europeans now are quite happy to embrace the concept of sovereignty at the European level. And, and they tend to sort of think that it's suddenly sort of unproblematic because it's being at the European level, which 
you know, goes back to the, the point I made about cosmopolitanism. This is a sense of when we talk about European sovereignty, that's somehow, you know, um, unproblematic and perhaps even expression of cosmopolitanism rather than just, you know, a similar trope that nationalists use, except at a regional level. So if we look back a little bit through history of uh, uh, European collaboration, I mean, what we sometimes call the European project. So, and I think you mentioned this in one of your pieces is that, I mean, when we're starting with the, uh, uh, the first attempts at collaborations on coal and steel, I mean, this is very much defined as an anti-nationalist type of, of um, activity. Um, it's, it's, it's built on sort of the philosophy that, well, you know what, we actually share the fate of Europe together, not the world, but the fate of Europe together. And we need to acknowledge that we all have a responsibility and we need to find better ways in order to make sure that we can have a trustful dependency on each other. So uh, we can trade in, in coal, steel or raw materials that you need in order to build up an army. And from then on, sort of, I would argue that even if it's stressed up at regionalism, uh, it's still a very sort of anti-nationalist um, uh, view that comes exactly as you say. Uh, but then I would say there's something which happens um, with the conceptualization of the European project, perhaps in the early 1990s, especially on the back of the successes with creating a single market with um, a few other things that happens in the world, which were perhaps even more important, like the collapse of, uh, uh, of the Soviet Union, um, the uh, reuni reunification of Germany um, and all that. And from then on, I'd say that there is a pretty active ingredient in a lot, how a lot of people think about Europe, including a lot of people in Brussels and people that occupy the commission, which is, it's not so much regional, it's more international. Um, and they look upon the European project as a big civilizing mission. It represents universalist values. It's not values that are specific to Europe or, or, or sort of the regional territory we have in Europe. They have an appetite for global solutions. They are not defensive. They are interested in the rest of the world and are getting closer to sort of a broad philosophy where we acknowledge that, well, you know what, we share the world with everyone else. So we need to find solutions in order to make this a good world. And um, on the basis of that comes sort of, you know, I don't want to use a terminology from international relations, but it's a liberal form of internationalism in sort of broader defined that grows from there. Um, I don't recognize that concept of Europe, that vision of Europe, and I, I don't, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it in Brussels or elsewhere in Europe. I hear exactly as I say, it's defensive, it's introvert, it's uh, they're a bit fearful of the world, and they challenge these principles, which is that, well, we need to build trustful de dependencies. Um, one of the best way to express the fact that we're sharing the world with all the others is that we're going to depend on them. We're going to depend on them for you know, supplies of everything from uh, goods and services to educational system. We're going to share knowledge. We're going to share ideas. We're going to try to find uh, an approach here which makes us more dependent on each other. And now I feel sort of that this idea is, is not at all what I'm hearing from sort of the, the mainstream rhetoric about, about Europe today. Those who want to reinforce the EU, they speak a very, very different language. Um, so com coming back to perhaps where I started, well, you may be right that Europe has never been cosmopolitan, but I think sort of part of its identity through the 1990s and the beginning of the noughties had those cosmopolitan ingredients to it. I mean, we were, we, we, we believed in the world, but I'm, I'm not so sure that many Europeans do that today. Yeah. So it, it sounds as if, you know, you share my sort of perception, my sense that there has been this kind of transformation in the last decade or so. Um, a, a lot of people who I've been discussing with this with, you know, over the last few months, just kind of don't really recognize the, the shift. They don't really think that the EU has changed in a dramatic way over the last 10 years. And to the extent that it has, they feel that that's just a natural response to the way the world around them is changing. Um, 
So it, it sounds as if we, we sort of, as I share this perception that, that there has been this kind of transformation in, in pro-European thinking in the last decade. Where we perhaps might slightly differ is, um, I think I'm perhaps, I, I think I see that earlier version um, as being a little bit perhaps more problematic than, than you do. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's complicated and, and I, I, in a way I, you know, I, I do sympathize with it more than the, what we're seeing now. But there was also something problematic about that period. And it's interesting that you use the phrase civilizing mission, because I think that immediately sort of captures there was something problematic about this. Um, I think, you know, if, if we go back to the, to the beginning of the European project, as you know, as you did with the coal and steel community, I think part of what makes this sort of quite complex is that there's been a lot of rewriting of history by pro-Europeans, you know, rewriting of the history of the European project. And I think this is a, this is a big problem. I, I think that the part of the reason that a lot of this has been obscured is because um, pro-Europeans, and, and I have to say, I, I also think the European studies as an academic discipline is implicated in this, has created a myth about the history of European integration that actually doesn't correspond to the real history. So I think we do need to be a bit careful about um, about accepting some of the myths about the earlier phases of European integration. And in particular, you know, it's true that, that it had this anti-nationalist impulse at the beginning. But then again, you know, there's the famous book by Alan Moore with the European Rescue of Nation State, right, which challenges the idea that actually this was somehow trying to overcome the nation state. Um, and, you know, there were different views among, you know, early pro-Europeans about this. Um, but I think what what to me is clear is that, you know, the, 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 from the beginning, the narrative about the European Union, about European integration, was about kind of trying to learn the lessons, um, the sort of internal lessons of European history, by which I mean the lessons from centuries of conflict between European powers that culminated in World War II and the Holocaust. Um, that was the, the sort of the basis for European integration was to was to avoid a repetition of continuation of that. However, um, there was never an attempt in the European project or among pro-Europeans to try to learn the lessons for what Europe collectively did to the rest of the world, and in particular colonialism. Um, and the really interesting thing, and this is where the um, the rewriting, I think, of, of, of the history of European integration comes in. I mean, the beginning of European integration, you know, the Treaty of Rome in 1957 is, is, you know, is signed at the precise moment of decolonization. And France, for example, you know, is fighting a brutal war, colonial war in Algeria at the time when it happens. And, you know, there's a very um, important book, which I mentioned in all of these uh, discussions um, about this by two of your compatriots, um, uh, Pio, Pio Hansen and, and Stefan Jonsson called Your Africa, which shows that, you know, in that moment in the 1950s, it wasn't just that um, the beginning of European integration coincided with decolonization, but that for a lot of the early founding fathers, um, European integration was in part conceived as a way for them, for Belgium and France in particular, to consolidate their colonial possessions in West Africa um, at a time when they were no longer able to maintain them on, the, on their own. And in particular, part of what they needed was an injection of West German capital. <laughs> Um, and that's part of what this project was about, Your Africa. Um, and it's very striking, for example, and this is something that you know very few pro-Europeans know, but at the time of the Treaty of Rome, the, the territory that it covered, 75%, around 75% of that was in Africa. It wasn't in Europe, because this was, as I say, Belgian and French colonies in West Africa, which the idea was very much to, to maintain. Now, they then ended up having, you know, losing those colonies fairly soon afterwards, and that's when I think you then get this um, more kind of inward looking civic kind of version of European identity. Then I think you're absolutely right, um, though, Frederick, that what happens after the end of the Cold War is there's a renewed attempt to sort of export Europe. So, it, you know, it goes, you know, again, from being inward looking to, for better or worse, to being a bit more outward looking. And... They, you know, you're right that there was a sort of universalist kind of uh, element of that. But as you've also suggested with the phrase civilizing mission, there was something very problematic about that, which also I think one has to say is a kind of a continuation 
of earlier European thinking during the colonial period, which also had these universal elements, and it was you know, justified in the name of the Enlightenment. And the idea was always to remake the world in the image of Europe. Um, and and you know, so what I think happens is after World War II, pro-Europeans, especially after the Cold War, pro-Europeans come up with a different way of exporting you know, the European model and, and, and European ideas and the European, European values and remaking the world in the image of Europe. Now, clearly, you know, it was less problematic than the earlier versions in, in, the, you know, in the colonial period, but there was still something problematic about it, I think. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's absolutely right that there was a renewed kind of civilizing mission. Um, now, as I say, there's been another turn where the EU has become, you know, more defensive and, and, and perceived the world in terms of threats and, and often seen those threats in civilizational terms. But I just want to sort of suggest that the earlier period was also somewhat problematic. I, I totally agree with that, Hans. And, and I, I, but I think sort of in my view, and I think in a lot of other people's views, well, when we talk about sort of a civilizing mission in the 1990s, I think it's much more about being confident about the institutions, democracy, rule of law, uh, expanding Europe to include countries um, that didn't come with a history um, yeah. at least not a long history of practicing those institutions. Yeah. Um, we were confident that, you know, we, we could expand Europe to include Turkey and, and that would sort of be a, sort of a good thing for Europe as well, because we were con confident that our, the quality of our institutions and the argument for them was strong enough in order to That's win. Right. So, so, and, but I mean, I'll, I'll, at the same time, we could add to that point, which is if we take the colonial <laughs> element of it and sort of looking back in the whole history that, um, Europe becomes also, I mean, sorry, the, the European community becomes partly a vector for old imperial countries, you know, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, uh, even now, sort of when it comes to having a general approach to uh, the continent where our former colonies were, especially Africa, which were pretty extractive in, in its approach. I mean, we, uh, we wanted to um, use the mines. Um, we want to get sort of some of the raw material, uh, but we also practice basically a trade policy which had uh, not the intention but the effect of ma making sure that there wasn't going to be sort of so much value added there. We kept um, some of the agricultural products out from our markets and, yeah. and didn't want to have sort of a tight integration where we are actually made ourselves dependent on them. Yeah. Um, so I think there was an That's element right. like that as well. However, co coming back to sort of um, uh, the, 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 the discussion right now. So, I mean, it's one thing you're saying, which, which I think is it's an interesting discussion. It's, it's the concept of civic nationalism. Um, is there a, would you say that has there ever been an idea of what civic nationalism means in the European Union context? Um, I, I get the feeling that sort of a lot of people still uh, are using Europe's own history of nationalism in order to generate that notion about civic nationalism. But that gets a bit difficult because even in the more liberal versions of that nationalism, we still have sort of a tight um, um, idea sort of about the role of language, um, how languages expresses um, national characteristics that needs to be protected in one way or the other to just give an example even if it's, it's not a blood and soil type of nationalism but it's still something where we make territory a quite important part for uh, sort of how the self embodiment of these these values are they are going to uh, emerge um, the alternative of course would be to look perhaps to sort of foreign examples of it take for instance america the american constitution I think there was an attempt at some elements in European history to move in a federal, federal type of direction where we would uh, at least use some of the precedents from, from constitutionalism in America. But that may have been difficult as well, given sort of the role of uh, you know, the covenant, the role of the pilgrims in, in, in trying to sort of chart in the first place what America represented and, and what nationalism or identity meant there. We had, of course, the melting pot type of idea of America that came after a while, but even that one was pretty minor for, for a long period of time. And 
um, sort of the concept of America was still sort of very much uh, Northeast, Wasp, uh, Boston, etc. Um, yeah. But sort of now, so civic nationalism today, where, where can, what can we derive it from in Europe? Yeah, um, this is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll sort of come to that, but maybe just to sort of recap on, on the previous point, because I think it's, it's relevant to this. I think it's important to say that, at least from my perspective, part of what this earlier European model was, was partly, as you say, about institutions and a particular mode of governance. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think from my perspective, at least from today's perspective, it, it feels like quite a technocratic form of governance. And I feel like part of the reason that that has become less compelling is because we can see now the problems with it from a democratic perspective, you know, in a way that we perhaps couldn't 20 years ago. That seemed like a model that one could expand and almost sort of replace politics with rules. And I think now we can see that that's, that's a slightly absurd thing to do. So it did have this institutional element that you're talking about, but I think it's also important to emphasize that it had an economic element, the social market economy and the welfare state. That was for a long time what the EU thought it stood for and was exporting. Um, and my perspective is that in the last 10 years, I have to say driven above all by Merkel, I think what's happened is that, you know, that's been hollowed out to a large extent internally within the EU, that model. Through, you know, I have to say economic liberalism, neoliberalism, which I think complicates this story about liberalism because I think one has to distinguish between political liberalism and economic liberalism. And, and so, you know, I think, I think what's happened is that the, you know, it, it's, it's no longer now in 2021, I think it's just much less credible and compelling for the EU to say, we stand for the social market economy and the welfare state, and we want to export that all around the world. Because as I say, internally, that's at least contested. But I would argue that you know, it's been to a large extent hollowed out, certainly in the Eurozone periphery. But even in Germany, I think you can make a pretty strong case that Germany has itself you know, hollowed out its own kind of social market economy. Um, and so I think that part of the reason that pro-Europeans are now thinking in much more cultural terms is precisely because that older socioeconomic model, which I think corresponded to a kind of civic regionalism, no longer sort of has any traction. Um, and so then all you've got left is culture. So then you start banging on about European values and the European way of life and, and cultural threats to Europe, i.e., you know, from Islam and, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, to me, that, that's sort of what's happened in the last sort of 10 years. And then to try to answer your question about well, if we were now to try to sort of develop this more civic regionalism, which I agree with you has to be, you know, it, A, it's possible, like, you know, I, I've not been arguing that it's impossible to have a kind of civic regionalism in Europe, that any European identity is destined to be ethnic or cultural. Um, I think it is possible to have a kind of civic regionalism, um, but I, I think it's quite difficult because, um, you know, historically these, these cultural and ethnic elements, I think have been constantly sort of, um, you know, they've, they've constantly sort of merged with the more civic elements. And by the way, you know, you mentioned American history, you know, this is also the case in the history of the United States, right? That you do, there is a sort of civic version of American nationalism. Um, interesting, you mentioned the melting pot because, you know, actually the, the melting pot, you know, when Israel Zangwill first used that term, this was specifically about Europeans. It was a melting pot of white Europeans. That's what the melting pot was. It wasn't a multiracial America that, that the melting pot captured. And in particular, the community that it excluded was African-American. They weren't part of that melting pot. They had a very different history, you know, not immigrants and so on. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we now know from the post sort of 2016 kind of perspective, we now know that, you know, American history and the American Republic has had these two elements. On the one hand, sort of democracy and this kind of universalist kind of civic kind of idea, but then also essentially white supremacy and, and you know, a, a, you know, a, a much more um, essentially sort of uh, cultural ethnic version of American identity. So that's all a way of saying, you know, you have the same story in America, but I think this is also the case in Europe. It's quite difficult to detach the, the cultural parts and the ethnic parts from the, from the civic parts. Um, and um, 
you know, one one example of that that, that I always sort of give, I mean, it, you know, it, it's been the case, you know, throughout this history of post-war European identity that as, you know, pro-Europeans have tried to sort of develop this civic identity, they've constantly had to draw on the cultural and ethnic components in order to generate support for this project, to give pathos to it and, and so on, right? One example of that, that I always mention is that, you know, the prize for pro-Europeans is the Charlemagne Prize, right? And Charlemagne, you know, is the embodiment of this medieval European identity that was synonymous with Christianity. So, you know, I think the, the place to start, it seems to me, is for pro-Europeans to be much more careful about how they express, you know, Europe and what Europe stands for and European identity and European values and all of these things than they currently are. They're very careless, it seems to me, about that. They'll happily draw on these ethnic and cultural elements, you know, without really thinking twice about it. So I think we, we have to start from, you know, being much more careful about this, um, even in terms of you know, the way we use the term, you know, pro-European or the European project. You know, I think we need to say the EU. Um, and, and, you know, pro-EU, not pro-European, because I think inevitably you then draw on um, the cultural and ethnic components. Um, and it is, it is difficult. It's, it's always been the case in other contexts as well, apart from the European case, that developing this kind of civic identity is a really challenging thing to do. And it tends to have some traction among elites, but it's quite hard to, you know, go beyond elites and, and this has been the story i think of this european identity as well is is this has been an elite project you know from from the beginning by the way even going back earlier if you, if you look in sort of history pre-1945 it tended to be elites that were pro-european um not ordinary people um and um and, and if you take say the german case as well you know again there's been this struggle at a national level in germany they had this concept of constitutional patriotism which again was an attempt to develop a civic nationalism in germany now it was a patriotism for professors as someone famously said right and it had some it's Habermas and so on it had some traction among its intellectuals but it never really gathered pace you know gathered any sort of real traction among ordinary germans um and and you know i so I think the same thing applies at a European level. Sorry, that's a very long way of saying, you know, I agree with you that it's possible, but it's quite difficult. So what I just heard you said, Hans, is that sort of the best way to promote a civic uh, regionalism in Europe is going to be the Champions League and the Eurovision Song Contest, right? <laughs> I, well, um, I, yeah, I, that's, I, need to, I need to think about that. All right. I need to so, think about how they fit into the story. Okay. Um, no, I was just joking. So let's let's move um, and dig a little bit deeper, sort of to the factors um, that have been driving um, uh, this particular development that we're talking about. So um, um, I think there are sort of several things that you already said that I'd like to pick up on and discuss. And um, as you've already mentioned, sort of I think a lot of people would think about the refugee crisis in 2015 sort of as a uh, a watermark um, uh, moment for when there is a change and then perhaps we have trump and brexit comes into play as well as uh, important events that are pushing europe in a direction of defensiveness and being more introvert um but i wonder here is is so what other factors are behind that Europe thinks in this increasingly defensive way about the world and, and that at least now there is, a, there is a, a new and higher form of premium in using a language which is, which is much more exclusive and exclusionary than we used in the past. So we talk about European values or protecting or promoting the European way of life um, what would you say sort of are foundational factors behind this particular development, apart from those that we've already covered? Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think I would probably divide it into sort of internal factors and external factors, right? Um, so I think there are some external factors, and these are the, the ones that pro-Europeans would point to, to say, look, you know, it, you know insofar as the EU has changed or pro-European thinking has changed, it's just a logical, you know, legitimate response to the way the world is changing around us. Um, so I think, um, uh, 
you know, I think here you'd have to include the rise of China because I think China, you know, China is one of the sort of perceived threats to Europe. Um, you mentioned Trump, you know, which I think was probably the moment at which the US was perceived as being a threat to Europe. Um, uh, Brexit, I think maybe also, but, but perhaps less so. Um, but I think you've also got to mention, um, you know, Russia and the sort of uh, shift in, in Russian policy, you know, since, you know, uh, I mean, over the last decade, um, to, to the point where now that's obviously also seen as being an increasing threat. Then you have, as a consequence, you know, another external cause is as a consequence of, you know, um, you know, conflicts in the Middle East, thinking particularly of Syria, um, that, you know, this sense that migrants are a threat. Um, you know, it, it's true that there is sort of increasing pressure from, my, you know, from, from, from migration. Um, so, you know, I think you have these external threats to which Europeans are responding. But, but then, as I say, to me, that, that would explain why Europeans have become more defensive, which, as I said at the beginning, I think is the first piece of this. But I don't think it explains why Europeans have come to see those threats to Europe as in cultural terms. So in other words, it exp explains the defensiveness, but it doesn't explain the civilizationism. Um, and there, as I say, my best attempt to explain this, and, you know, I, you know, I, I, it's just my, you know, me trying to figure this out. I'm not sure how, you know, how definitive this is. But, um, but as I say, I, I, this is where I do think that this, this sort of the internal factors come in. And in particular, this way in which Europe has sort of shifted away from um, this uh, earlier model, socioeconomic model that it, that it stood for, um, and the institutional kind of the particular mode of, of governance which, as I say, the, the EU, I think, stood behind much more than it does now since there's been this internal, I think, backlash against it, against the technocratic mode of governance that the EU stands for. So I think you've had these internal shifts in Europe. And to me, that explains the civilizational turn rather than the defensiveness. Um, and, um, and, and there's an interesting way in which it sort of all comes together, which I think might be the, the latest kind of twist in this story in a way is, you know, to listen now to the European Commissioner for promoting the European way of life, talk about migration as a hybrid threat, which he's now been doing over the last couple of weeks. And this is, you know, partly in response to the way that migration is perceived as being weaponized by Belarus, Turkey and Morocco. Um, so I think now there's this sort of merging of the migration threat and then these kind of state actors like Russia and Turkey, um, and that's kind of merged. And, and I mean, but, but it's, to me, it's extraordinary to hear immigration being talked about as a hybrid threat. Um, and that does, I think, imply a certain kind of securitization of the approach to migration beyond what's already taken place. And, and I just mentioned that because I think it illustrates the sort of way in which these internal and external things have sort of come together um, and yeah, and, and, and so I, I think what you get is this Europe that just sees itself being, you know, surrounded by these threatening actors of different kinds um, and, and therefore becomes very, very defensive. So if I can now for sort of a, a, another uh, theory or thesis here about it, I mean, I think, I think there is some degree of uh, both increasing defensiveness and sort of adding that civilization-based element to uh, how Europe thinks about itself, what we represent and who we are and, 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 and these type of things. I think it's also one element of it is the fact that Europe's power in the world is going down and our, our sort of economic uh, leadership for the world is going to get um, uh, less influential than it has been in the past for the simple reason and for a good reason which is that the rest of the world is growing they are becoming richer and as a consequence of that we have relative economic decline not just for Europe but also for America and, and a few other countries in the world um, but I, I think that sort of part of the um, appetite for the rest of the world that we had in Europe in the 1990s were partly because they thought 
this was a way to maintain European influence and sort of European pride and, and making sure that the world was going to remain pretty Eurocentric in the future, that whatever issue we're talking about, we know that as in history in the past, that a lot of people will have to turn to Europe because that's where, that's where we, we think that um, the major developments for our future are charted. And, and now we are sort of in a world where it, it's, to me, it's perfectly obvious that fewer and fewer in the world are interested in what goes in Europe. They are much more interested to learn about what happens at universities in Singapore, in India, in South Korea, uh, what type of cultural developments, what music are being sort of played in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America, and, and in that sense, less, less interested in Europe and, and in America. Um, so I think there is... Uh, there's an element of that. Um, another element I would say is to connect it, what you say around sort of the economy and how the economy and, uh, and sort of the social, mo the model of the sort of the social market economy hangs together with uh, a more cultural response to the idea of Europe is, uh, I think there's a widespread feeling uh, that uh, several parts of Europe, not all, but several parts of Europe are very bad at offering good economic opportunities to people. And that may be to young people or to unemployed people or to migrants that come to Europe or to old people. I mean, it's, it's, it differs between what countries that we're talking about, but there's a general sense of falling economic opportunity, which is partly a consequence of the fact that, well, if we, if we accept that we're going to live in a 1% growth economy, it's, it's obvious that opportunities are going to be smaller and smaller. Um, because a 1% economy is not going to offer that many new opportunities to people. But sort of my, what I, what I would take it is, um, is that for a long period of time, um, the European Union offered um, an opportunity for member states and for people around Europe to actually change that. Um, which was that, you know, if we did more single market reforms, we open up between each other, there was going to be a premium, an economic premium that came and that could live a little bit more growth. But now we seem to have sort of run into the wall on these issues. We sort of, we, we, we created a common cur currency and saved resources and made efficiency there. But uh, what else can we do in, no. in, in that field in order to create new economic opportunities? Yeah. It, it rather feels like sort of we're getting stuck in our own imagination for, so what can you do at the European level, which actually is going to be meaningful for uh, people, in, the, people in, in Europe or people in the world when it comes to improving economic opportunity? Some people talk about, you know, we need to deepen the single market, which is all fine, but we need to at the same time acknowledge that we're perhaps talking about adding 0.2% to GDP uh, by doing that. So <laughs> it's not sort of really big things we're talking about. On all the things that really matter for economic opportunity today, education, ideas, how we spread ideas and knowledge, uh, I'd say sort of most parts of, of European Union is pretty insignificant and doesn't play much, much of a role at all for what happens there. So may there be an element of that, that we perhaps have run into the wall in terms of what, what, what more can we do at, at the EU level in order to offer some relief to those who feel pressured uh, in their economic opportunities? Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. So, so on the first part about European decline, um, I mean, yes, absolutely. I think, a Euro you know, this perception of European decline is a big part of this story. The only thing I would add, though, is that to me, this is, this is nothing new. You know, there's been a feeling of European decline for a century, at least, you know, and, and it's really interesting. I've, I've just been reading a, a, a book called The Idea of Europe, um, which sort of goes much further back in, in, in European history. And it's very striking, the parallels between now and this moment in the sort of, you know, the interwar period in the, in the 1920s, because actually the discourse is remarkably similar. This is when the sort of pan-European movement, you know, gets going, actually. And, and the logic is exactly the same. It's we are declining. Um, in particular, this, you know, this, this, the beginning of this, um, uh, of, of seeing Europe, understanding Europe in geopolitical terms. Um, and in particular, you know, we as Europeans are threatened by Russia and the United States. I mean, that was all there in the 1920s. Um, and, and hence, we need to unite. And, and it illustrates that, you know, um, pro-Europeanism, 
European integration was always not just about peace, which is what the rhetoric says, but it was about power. It was about Europeans trying to retain their power in the world as they inevitably, as you say, declined. That's been going on for a century. And as I say, this is also where the Africa story becomes really interesting because there's a, you know, there's a moment when they're also just trying to retain their colonies as part of a, a strategy of maintaining their power in the world. Um, so, you know, this is, I think, a, a very sort of long story. And, and I think what the moment we're at now is where it seemed as if the EU offered a way of reversing or at least kind of slowing that de de relative decline. And then, as we discussed a little bit earlier, pro-Europeans got a bit carried away and they thought not just can we re you know, reverse our decline, but we can reshape the whole world in our own image. And that's all now, I think, falling apart. And, and so I think that's the, the, the kind of moment we're at now. And then on this question of the economy and opportunities and, and, and the EU, this is really interesting. Um, I think I have a slightly different take on this. I'm not sure if I'm disagreeing with you or not, but I think the way I would think about it was that I would divide actually the history of European integration in economic terms into two phases. And, and by the way, it roughly corresponds with, you know, the overall story of, you know, which is the, the post-war period, which is you have this, you know, you have the Tante Glorieuse, um, and it's a period of moderate globalization. And then, you know, from the 80s onwards, particularly after the Cold War, you have, you know, a, a second phase, you know, basically a neoliberal phase, um, and that corresponds to hyper-globalization, you know, and, and I think that the story of European integration can be divided into two parts in exactly the same way that correspond to those, those changes. So I, I think, you know, to put it in very reductive terms, I think we have sort of gone from a Keynesian EU, I mean, it wasn't the EU at that time, but a Keynesian EEC to a neoliberal EU. And, you know, the, the, the crucial moment here when the EU is sort of refounded in a way is the, is the creation of the single market in, in, in 1985, which, you know, um, restarts the kind of momentum because European integration has sort of essentially stalled. Um, you know, judicial integration was continuing through the ECJ, but, but you know, in terms of, you know, treaties and so on, um, it had stalled and then it's restarted. And this, I think, does really remake the EU. Now, one has to say, this is kind of a British thing to a large extent because it was the Thatcherite project, the single market. Um, so I think Britain bears some of the responsibility for this. Um, but then there's a, you know, it goes even further with the creation of the single currency after the end of the Cold War. So, you know, I think there was a kind of a neoliberalization of the European project. And then there was a kind of an auto liberalization, one might say, with the creation of this single currency based very much on, on German terms. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of what I was hinting at with this idea of sort of hollowing out of the, of the social market economy and what had been the European model. Um, so, you know, I suppose I don't, I suppose to put it bluntly, I don't think that further liberalization, economic liberalization in Europe is the solution. I think that's been the problem. That's precisely been the problem. Um, you know, so to put it bluntly, as I, say, I would kind of say that Europe has gone, has become too liberal in economic terms. Um, and, you know, as I say, I, I think the, it, this, in a way, this isn't really an EU story, though. It's, it's, it's about a political shift that's taken place across the continent. And if you take, say, again, Germany, you know, there's a very good book called Die Abstiegsgesellschaft by Oliver Nachtwey, which literally translates as the downwardly mobile society. You know, and the way he, des he describes essentially how Germany has gone, West Germany, you know, and then unified Germany has gone from being an upwardly mobile society to a downwardly mobile society, which directly kind of gets to your point about, you know, opportunities for people, right? Um, the, the sort of the creation of the low wage sector and the precariat in Germany, you know, um, let alone in other European countries. Now, where I think the EU fits into that story, it comes back to the technocratic mode of governance that we were discussing earlier, because I think what the EU has done has been to create a set of rules based on that neoliberal thinking, in particular, obviously the fiscal rules in the, in the Eurozone, and, and Sweden is lucky enough not to, to, to be in that, um, but because it's kind of constitutionalized that particular economic policy, what it's done is it's taken it out of the space of democratic contestation, 
And so this isn't any longer just an economic policy that there was a consensus around at one given moment that can then be shifted, but it becomes almost impossible to change it. So, you know, now that I think we're seeing, I mean, especially since the pandemic, the need for perhaps a different type of approach, perhaps, you know, bigger governments in, in certain ways, it's quite difficult for the EU, at least the Eurozone, to make that shift because it's constitutionalized the fiscal rules. So I suppose what I'm saying is I, th I think what happened is a political shift across Europe, um, for which, as I say, Britain is partly responsible. But then what happened was the EU just made it really difficult for, the e for Europe to change direction. That's kind of where I think we are. All right, that's very interesting, Hans. Um, we should move on a little bit because we don't have that much time left. I want to ask you a little bit about the future and what you think, sort of if you take your analysis um, laid out here, laid out in your articles, where, where do you think Europe is going now? That's... Um, I, I mean, know it's a, big, it's a big issue, but the big question, but uh, yeah. what, what's, what's the path that I, comes I think, I think I'm, 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 I'm still roughly with... Um, Klaus Offer, the German political scientist who wrote a book a few years ago called Europe Entrapped. Um, and, 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 and I think Europe is still sort of entrapped. It's difficult to sort of see a way out of all of these different problems. Um, you know, I won't get into it in too much detail, but all the sort of overlapping fault lines within Europe about different sets of issues. Um, and it's difficult to see how one moves further with integration to solve these problems. It's also difficult to see how one might slightly sort of unwind certain problematic aspects of European integration, like, I mean, certainly the fiscal rules, but I would argue the Euro. Um, uh, so it's quite difficult to see how you move backwards or forwards. Um, and, and, and so I suppose my rather pessimistic view of what's gonna happen in the EU over the next 10, 20 years is, is just a sort of, it's, it's kind of more of the same. It's just a, a gradual, sort of process of, of um, you know, in increasing tensions, um, increasing Euroscepticism, um, and, uh, and a sort of weakening uh, and, and, and further sort of relative decline um, of Europe. Uh, I'm sorry to be so pessimistic, but... No, no, you don't, you don't need to be sorry. I mean, we can go into or perhaps at least test a few optimistic theses a little bit later, but... Uh, I, sh so, I, should but say, I should say that what, what I'm not suggesting is going to happen is a breakup of the EU. You know, and, and a lot of the discussion over the last 10 years has focused on that, a breakup of the Eurozone of the EU. I'm not suggesting that because I think the political will, at least for now, remains so strong to keep, you know, the European project going that, you know, my worry is not so much that the EU or the Eurozone breaks up, it's what pro-Europeans will be prepared to do to keep it together in a sense yeah no indeed no I, th I think i think i think that's a good um model to use to think about it i mean sort of my own model would be sort of i'm i'm more worried about um leadership and attempt at the european level to come up with solution that responds to our problems now than i am about europe rushing away in an excessively federalist uh direction um so there's a greater risk that we are about to turn into sort of a um, sort of a, a, a holy Roman Empire, uh, neither holy nor Roman, not an empire, and and it was after a while just forgotten. It's um, because uh, it became insignificant. Um, so in in terms of political leadership, so wh where I mean, I'm I'm not asking you sort of to to point to things that make you optimistic, but sort of. Where do you see the main ideas or the main visions for Europe? Where do they come from? Who are offering them? And, and do you think they have an idea about uh, what an alternative and better future could be? You mean the sort of positive visions that I might... Not, sort of... Well, not, not necessarily positive, but if you start sort of what are the big, big visions or see my big visions, or at least visions coming from some of yeah. the leaders in Europe? I mean, we have... At least in Paris, I think we yeah. have one person who is aspiring uh, to offer leadership for, for, for Europe. Um, perhaps there will be people in Berlin um, soon that um, are a little bit, bit more visionary than the yeah. uh, current occupant in the Chancery. Yeah. Um, the, so what, the, what, what, do, what, what do you think they say about, about Europe? What do they want to do? The, the way I thought of it, um, in the last few years is that 
the dynamic within Europe is essentially a clash and sort of struggle between three different visions for Europe, which is essentially, you know, the Merkel vision, the Macron vision, and the Orban vision. Um, so, you know, it's essentially three different right-wing versions of, of, of Europe, I think. And the left, I think, has been sort of pretty sort of marginal. Um, and, you know, so you have, you know, the, the Merkel vision of a competitive Europe, um, you know, which, as I kind of hinted at earlier, is, is all about sort of um, reforming, you know, doing structural reform, making the EU competitive, and, and I think in the process of hollowing out a lot of what Europe used to stand for. Um, then there's the Macron vision, which has shifted over time, but it's the Europe that protects. And, and initially, I think what, what, what Macron meant by that was, was actually economic protection. Um, you know, what he wanted to do was reform the Eurozone and essentially create a more redistributive EU. So in a sense, actually, I think it started out as a sort of centre-left vision for Europe. But then what I think happened was it was rejected by Merkel, sort of ignored by Merkel. And then he reinvented it, Liu Opki Potej, as sort of cultural protection from, from Islam, essentially. Um, so he sort of moved, I think, to the right in a different kind of way than Merkel. It's a sort of, it's a kind of cultural kind of right-wing vision rather than economic right-wing vision, which I think is what Merkel had. And then you've obviously got the Orban vision, which is sort of obviously much more Eurosceptic than the other two. It's about a Europe of sovereign states. But in some ways it links up, particularly with the Macron version, you know, we mentioned this at the beginning, um, in this kind of cultural, civilizational kind of um, uh, the, the tropes that, that, are, that are used. And I think there's this complex kind of negotiation between the three of them. Um, and it's producing, I think, um, you know, what we, what we, see, what we see now. Um, I, I suppose um, if I, if, you know, to try and be a bit more hopeful, you know, maybe with the next German government, if it's led by the SPD, that could lead to something different. But I, I suppose I, I'm a little skeptical because it seems to me that the Merkel consensus continues in Germany even after Merkel leaves, you know, and, and Olaf Scholz, you know, has set himself up as a continuity, you know, the continuation of Merkel in the same way that Laschet has, um, you know, so I think there's this kind of centrist kind of consensus in, in Germany that doesn't disappear just because Merkel is no longer in, in the chancellery, but, you know, maybe I'll be proved wrong and maybe Olaf Scholz will turn out to be a much more creative and sort of radical chancellor than, than, um, than, than it seems, but. All right, so we have a, a coronation of Merkel II um, going on in Germany right now because we are recording well, well, Merkel, this, of course. I think, it's, I think it's Merkel V, isn't oh, it? <laughs> <laughs> or M Merkel II, we can say at least, or Merkel, her, her fifth government. Uh, we're recording this just a few days before Germany uh, goes to the polls. Um, all right, very good. I'm, I'm going to end with a couple of points that have been raised by some of the participants, um, um, uh, which I think sort of are, are, are useful um, and just put them to you. Um, I mean, one is, one is on, on demography, um, and which I think is, is a good point to make given the demographic development in several countries in Europe, uh, Germany, Italy, for instance, um, um, and there is some, there's something that happens to society, which is uh, have falling populations and where an increasingly large share of the population are gray haired. Um, uh, so what do you, what do you think uh, demography plays? Uh, how does it play into this? Um, another point is on uh, sort of pushback on, on, uh, on your critique of um, uh, European economic liberalization. Um, yeah. Uh, and the question is here: so, so what what would the Europe what would Europe look like without these liberalisation products in the past? Would would there would there even have been an EU to talk about in the first place if we hadn't sort of gone for them? Um, so yeah. and and uh, uh, and lastly, I think uh, um, uh, a point around uh, liberalism, uh, which is a pretty pessimistic comment, which is that liberalism seems to be a luxury condition, um, yeah. uh, only tenable as long as most people have positive expectations yeah. for the future. Yeah. Um, and I think that is also a good point to, to, to put to you, sort of, you know, what, to what extent is our, perhaps, if I use that term, falling confidence in ourselves in Europe, to what extent is it 
is it sort of leading to a decline in liberalism? We need to have some confidence about ourselves yeah. in order to uh, maintain liberalism in whatever shape or form we want to yeah. uh, discuss it. All right, over to you, Hans. I mean, these are great questions. I, I think, um, Frederick, we need a we need a, a part two of, of this discussion to to, to really answer them. Um, but let me have a quick go. So. First of all, on demography, yeah, absolutely, uh, it's really important and and um, really interesting. I think um, Janet, who who asked this question, um, uh, is talking about Hungary, and 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 I think there is, you know, you, you're right that uh, Frederick, that you know, Germany and Italy have you know aging societies, um, but then there's a migration part of this story as well, and and um, you know. Central and Eastern European and Southeastern European economies, you know, are losing. It's not just that they're aging, but they're losing, you know, a lot of people through emigration, which is leading to, the, you know, I think Ivan Krastev has sort of called this, you know, demographic panic or something like that. Um, and by the way, I think that the consequence of that is going to be that freedom of movement in the long run is not tenable. Um, not sustainable not not because you know not only because of countries like the uk that had a problem with people coming but countries that are going to have a problem i think increasingly people leaving um so i think there's going to be you know uh at some point you know a, a rethink of freedom of movement is going to be necessary unless the eu is going to be willing to tolerate essentially the depopulation of huge kind of chunks of, of europe which i i can't see that that's politically sustainable I think the demographic issue is important. I think it's not, it's it's both cultural and economic. It's both of these things. Um, there's clearly a cultural component to, to the demographic um, fear, not least because, you know, one obvious solution to this is immigration. You know, so roughly I think where Europe, a lot of European countries are is that objectively they need immigration but they don't want immigration for essentially cultural kind of reasons, because that would mean the end of the European way of life. I think that's roughly where we where we are. Um, economic liberalism and competitiveness. So this really does require a longer conversation about, about which you'd have a lot to say, I think, Frederick. Um, but I suppose, I mean, my quick response to that would be, well, I don't really understand what competitiveness is, in, you know, as, as far as a country goes. I understand what a competitive company is. I don't really understand. This is, you know, Paul Krugerman. I don't really understand what a competitive country is. And I, and I think the, the discourse of competitiveness, and I, I tried to sort of half answer this question when I was talking about Merkel earlier on. You know, this is very much, I think, the Merkel approach is to make Europe competitive. I think often what that amounts to, at least in the German case, is having a current account surplus. I think that's how um, competitiveness is, is basically defined in Germany. Um, and, you know, the attempt was to, Kind of make the whole of Europe have a current account for which would be absolutely disastrous for the, for the global economy, right? So I think this is a dangerous route to go down. Um, uh, you know, this sort of competitiveness route. I think it's part of Europe's problem, but it, but I think the other problem with it is it, it it I think it it's part of what has exacerbated the the internal imbalances and inequalities within Europe. So I think it it makes European sort of cohesion harder. And then finally on liberalism, again, this is a long conversation, um, but I'd want to slightly disaggregate different kinds of liberalism because liberalism can mean so many different things. Even if you forget the way that Americans use it, where it's basically a synonym for, you know, left or progressive, um, even if you just, you know, look at the way that Europeans use it. It, it can mean so many different things. You know, liberalism, it can be economic liberalism, it can be political liberalism, it can be liberalism in international relations terms, which is different, again, you know, sort of contrasted with realism. Um, now, so this is such a complex kind of thing, liberalism. And this is why, you know, at the beginning, I said there's been this tendency to think in a very binary way, you know, this is a struggle between liberalism and illiberalism. Liberalism is good and illiberalism is bad. I, I don't really see it that way. And my personal sort of views, and obviously this reflects my own sort of politics, but, you know, I, I sort of am more comfortable with certain kinds of liberalism more than others. Um, and, you know, as, as, you know, I sort of hinted at a minute ago, I'm somewhat skeptical of not economic liberalism as such, but certainly, certain versions of economic liberalism. You know, I am critical of what I would call neoliberalism. So, um, and I think that's a big part of Europe's problem. So 
I guess I, I would want to just say liberalism is complicated um, and it's not just this simple good thing. Um, it, it's, it's kind of more, more complex than that. And um, uh, I'd want to sort of hold on to liberalism in some respects, particularly in political terms, although there again, it's complicated because often in our discussions, particularly in the sort of foreign policy think tank world, we tend to use liberalism and, and democracy as being almost synonyms, but they're actually not at all. Liberalism is very different from democracy. And in a liberal democracy, there's a tension between liberalism and democracy. They sort of constrain each other. Um, you know, liberalism being, you know, individual rights guaranteed by a constitution, democracy being popular sovereignty, the constitution and those rights limit what you can do through popular sovereignty. And that's kind of, you know, the idea of liberal democracy. And I do think this comes back to the, what I was saying earlier about the sort of technocratic mode of governance or sort of depoliticized mode of governance in the EU. I do think that a big part of the crisis of democracy within the EU especially is that we've gone to, the EU has gone too far in liberalizing actually, that, that, you know, actually what's happened is that the liberal part of that has undermined the democratic part, the popular sovereignty part, because as I say, what's happened is there's been this expansion of, of rules and constitutionalization, including of economic policy. Um, so in a sense, I would say that, you know, part of the problem within the EU is that liberalism as distinct from democracy has gone too far. But as I say, this is a this is getting into real sort of um, complex kind of new nuances about about liberalism. So you know maybe we can continue this another time. Absolutely, and looking forward to that, Hans. Um, let me just say thank you so much for taking the time. This has been um, uh, a very joyful conversation. I. Uh, strongly recommend that people read uh, your two pieces. We have also so shared them in the chat function. So you can just click on the links there and you can read them. Um, um, and hope to see you again soon, Hans, to continue this conversation. Thank you so much, Frederick. It's been really fun. We covered a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of different subjects. We did. All right. I hope we Thank you. Soon. Thanks, Frederick. Thank you. And thank you to everyone else that have participated and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.